on and the count is going down. What numbers or letters are on there? I've done four pages, A, B, C, and D. We, I have not done anything past. We're in chapter one, verse two, which we're very, very close to. But again, next week, hopefully, I'll, I'll jump us uh, a lot further. But we've got a lot to discuss still in verse one. So, you know, we're not going to get off of page D. I don't think. If we do, I'll apologize. But I, I really kind of doubt it because we've got a great discussion coming up. So, okay, are we ready? Because we'll edit all of that. <laughs> and then we'll start. It is Wednesday afternoon, January 29th. Now we got to start over again. Would you like to come up? Would you like no, to table? Fine. You don't need a table to be able to write? Yes, I'm all set up. Bless your heart, Margaret. So glad you made it. Okay. Oh, Tony, do you want it? You have to take the whole set. It's one complete set. You don't want one page. You want all four pages. Okay. Are we ready? Roger, you get to edit twice. <laughs> so it is Wednesday, January 29th. We are picking up. We're hurrying so quickly, we are in Bereshit, Genesis 1, 1. <laughs> a very good place to start. But we have had a good study looking at the background of our creation. We looked at our first three words in Hebrew, bara, there, I'm sorry, Bereshit, bara, Elohim. We looked at that in depth last week, so I will not go back into that, except to just say it means in the beginning, created, Gods, and we saw gods is not little gods. It is our one true and living God who is presented to us as God the Father and God the Son. We look at scriptures that show both were involved in creation, and we'll soon move into seeing that the Spirit also is very much a part of creation. That we have the triunity of God working it out. And I read something last night, and I can't remember it. I like it. Hopefully, I'll find it in my notes. It said the Father's the source. The Spirit's the energizer, and the Son is the revealer. I think I like that. I'm still working on that. You know, I'm, I'm, I, nothing's going to be perfect down here. We can't ever get a full example that gives the quality to all three and at the same time shows the individuality. You know, we, we come up with things like water, you know, in the three, the we see ice, water, vapor, the A, the, the shell, yolk, and white. The, like I say, the shell isn't equal to the yolk, the yolk isn't equal to the white. So, you know, this is as close as we can get in human form to try to understand our, our triune God. That's not odd in Hebrew. That's typical in Hebrew. That's typical in Hebrew, and they'll also do the nouns and then the adjectives follow. So, it, to give you an example, instead of saying, look at the red car, in Hebrew they'll say, look at the car red. Okay. okay, and the verbs can come to different order also, they can, they can come differently, but remember our verb is a singular verb for a plural noun, showing again the unity. We talked about that from the Hebrew, from the word of God, the united one, we saw it from the sheen, the letter it looks like the W with the base at the bottom, so it's three equal branches all tied together. We see many ways that God has given us his uh, magnanimous persona. Is that, is that a right way to put it? You know, again and again and again on the broken record that we have an inadequable God, which yes. means he's too, too big to be con constrained into one. We, we just are never going to get there. But we get the idea, and we know that if we could think God out, figure them out, put them under the microscope and, and get the details, well then he'd be no better than whoever that great mind is that could figure that all out. And I don't know about you, but I'm thrilled that my God is greater than <laughs> any other. So, uh-oh, we are not CD number four, so if you mark that down, be sure you notice the change. We're all the way to five, okay. CD number five, we are moving forward. Okay, last time where we ended and where I will pick up, we were talking about since we have looked at scripture as it reveals it to us as fact, we have the fact that God created. He doesn't argue it. He doesn't argue that he is God. He doesn't argue that he existed. He just brings you the fact. God existed. He existed before his creation, and God is the one who created. 
and went into arguments against some of the other philosophies and beliefs that have come down the line since. But where I hurried in the very end was by looking at the fact that God created, it will explode, you know, make it go to bits and pieces is what I'm trying to say, the false philosophies. I'll repeat them because I hurried last time. It denies atheism. Atheism wants to say there is no God. It starts with the assumption there is a God. It doesn't even give room to argue that. It's just there. It denies polytheism, which means there's more than one God. It confesses that there is one eternal creator God. Now, again, we see him in the three parts, but we know he is one. It denies materialism, the assertion that matter was here. Matter came together. Big bang. No, because matter is not eternal. Matter was created according to our scriptures. It denies humanism. God, not man, is the ultimate reality. Everything doesn't center in man. Man isn't his own God, and he doesn't get to call the shots. And I tell people, when you don't like the rules, well, when you create your own world, and your own people in your world, you can make your own rules. But until then, you get to play by the game that God created called Earth, <laughs> Heaven, and He's God. <laughs> okay? It uh, denies evolutionism, the thought that things evolved. Because God does not give us any room for that. He gives us that He created so I'm like to say, well, he put the evolutionary process in the motion. Well, as we continue through the next couple of chapters, you show me where it gives room for the evolutionary process. It does not. It denies pantheism, which is the doctrine that the universe is God. God's in everything. He's in matter. He's in people. He's in the trees. He's in everything. Everything is God. But we see that God created. That means he's apart from these things. He's not a part of them. He is the creator of them. So it puts God above everything that pantheism holds up as God's. And it denies fatalism. Fatalism is fate's in control. I don't have any control over it. It's fate. I don't like when I hear even believers say that, oh, it's, it, it was their fate. No, it wasn't their fate. God is in control, and that's what he says. It shows the freedom of the eternal being, who I'm referring to as God, to act. He spoke, it came into existence. When he chooses for something to stop, it stops. We're told in other places that he's ordained our days, our starts and our stops. For believers, he's ordering every step along the way. This puts him totally in control. That does not mean that he's a mean God, because that's the next thing I'll hear. Oh, well, then God made that happen. How could God let my son get killed? How could God do these terrible things? No. God set into motion a holy standard of living. He put into this world, we're going to see a beautiful environment and a wonderful life. That life did not have death. It did not have all the ramifications of what sin brought into this world. But because God, being a loving God, did not want puppets, did not want to put you on a string and then pull the string and like the dolls we little girls grew up with, you know, I love you, <laughs> I will obey. <laughs> God doesn't want that. He wants the heart. He wants you to obey him and love him because that's what's in your heart. So he allowed freedom to be the criteria in this world. Do you love me and will you follow me and be obedient to me and you will be blessed. Adam and Eve had it made. They weren't needing anything. But when they allowed themselves to be, Eve to be, um, um, they were both tempted. Deceit. Deceit. When you choose deceit, where Adam willfully took. When this happened, they brought consequences in. Those consequences are what we see happening in this world today. 
for a period of time that God has ordained, sin is running rampant in this world. Sin is what causes these evil things to happen. And the one who is behind sin, instigating it, who we know to be Satan or Satan is, is how you pronounce it, he is behind the evil of this world. God is not behind it. And you say, well, if God's all-powerful, he can stop it. Yes, he can. And he could have stopped it from ever entering into this world, but then it can. If he took away the freedom, then all he would have is puppets. And it isn't what he was after. We see that God created angelic beings, had them in his very presence. And sin entered that world through the one called Lucifer, who got it in his heart. And we're going to go over that if we get far enough today, that he wanted to be like God. He brought ramifications into the heavenly realm, right into the very presence of a holy God. And unfortunately, a number of the angels, a third of the angels, followed Satan. They suffer consequences for that. And we don't see that God brought them a way of salvation. Why did he bring it to us and not to them? I think because... That sin was right in his very presence. Seeing God, living in that environment with God, there was no excuse. There was no deceit. There was no falling short that God could accept. And so he did not make a way for the angels who followed to be restored. But God in his love for his human being that he did make, knowing that we in essence are lesser than the angels, we're lower than the angels. We're here on earth. We're not in where we see God. It is a walk by faith. It is a, a faith that needs to grow. And God nurtures it, gives us, gives everyone that that um, bit of the, the, the spark of faith, I'll put that, so that everyone can come to believe. And as they exercise that, he brings them more and more light to bring them into salvation. But again, he... he had, I don't want to say had more heart for us, but man, since he did, and provided for us out of his very own being. That's amazing. That's love. When you see that he stopped at nothing short, that he gave his own son, who is very God himself, who shed his own blood, came down, left a perfect environment to live in a sin soft world, to be mistreated by mankind, to suffer at the hands of man, to die because of those evil haters. Well, they love evil, but, you know, the haters of God. He stops at nothing short. How could you say he's not a God of love? So when something happens so bad that you cannot understand, you have to realize that also is grieving God's heart. He didn't intend for that to be the <clears throat> way that life was. Man brought these consequences in on himself. And thankfully, oh, how I thank God. This is in the scheme of eternity for the short time. We will be brought back into a place where there will be no more sin. There will be no more death. There will be no more pain. There will be no more suffering. You'll never hear the word cancer again. You'll never hear the horror stories that, that, that people are sharing all the time. Turn on your news. This week was horrendous. You don't have to look any further than our news locally. But that will all be over. And what God wanted will be for eternity. Thank you, Lord. Yes. That's where we're headed. So we have to understand God in his love allows this time. And in those hardships, God is in there saying, I love you. I want you. I want to help you. I'll meet your needs. I'll get you through this. I could show you believer after believer after believer that will tell you, if it were not for my faith, I would not make it through this. But because of my faith, I am making it through this. Amen. We even heard the family that lost the 16-year-old son in that, the car with the kids that were killed. I heard the father say it is our, our that, that we're Christians, so we're not after the one who did it. We're not out for his blood. The sister, who looks to me to probably be maybe 15, between the, the younger son that survived and the, the older son that did not survive, 
The news media cut it off, but she got the words out before it did because of my faith. And I'm silent. She didn't get to finish a sentence, but we can finish the, the sentence. We can all give examples if I went around the room. That's where our thought is. I'll make it very personal because it's thrown in my face, being Jewish. Where was God in the Holocaust? How could God allow six million to, to be incinerated, to be killed in horrific ways? The horror stories that I can't even read. I have to close the books because I, I can't handle it. Where was my God? He was in those camps, bringing the truth, the message to people in those camps that maybe never would have heard if they weren't there. And they heard and they accepted the Lord and they're in heaven now. And even on a wider scale, Israel came out of the ashes of the Holocaust to fulfill God's word prophetically. Israel is there today fighting for her existence, still but has a right to say, this is why we need a place where Jews are safe, because of what happened. So God even uses the horrors of something like the Holocaust. Is that grievous to him? Yes. Yes. I believe God grieves over every lost soul. Whether they're Jewish or Gentile doesn't matter. He created them all. But there's where my God is. He was there in those circumstances. He was walking through them with those who would allow him to. You all know Corey Tim Boom, who loses a father, who loses a sister. Sister dies in her arms. She got through because of her faith. That was all that kept her going. And it was her faith that, that kept her going long after it was over because it doesn't end right there. And we know it was because of her walk with her God, she was able to even forgive. And I've heard another testimony of forgiveness recently that is off the charts that, that you know there's a God who loves through the evils or if these people could not come to that point of forgiving like they do. We've got a mighty God who sees a huge plan and we squawk looking at a little bit and thinking we know so much. <laughs> We don't have a clue. I think so many times the little child that's begging for candy for dinner and thinks mommy and daddy are mean because they're saying no. <laughs> when we throw our little hissy fit at our father, but this is so good. Why wouldn't this be good for me? Why can't I have it, God? And we don't know how foolish our request is and how the love of our Father holds back from giving us what we really don't want if we knew. That's our God. That's the God of love. That's the God who in creation intimately came into relationship with his creation. That's amazing. And I could show you that from the Hebrew at other times, but it's not our point for today. I want to move on from today, but I'm setting this for us that answers whatever question is brought up. The last time we also were talking about, well, what about those who don't get to hear? Well, God gave them creation to know. Everyone sees creation. No matter where you are on the face of this planet, it speaks of a master designer. And if they recognize that, come to that light, God gives them more light. If God needs to send them an angel to whisper in their ear, do you think for a moment he won't do that? Of course he would. Look at what all he has done. And again, his son. I mean, there's nothing more you can do than give your own son. So there's no one that's going to ever stand before God and say, I didn't have a chance. God will show them how they have a chance. He will answer every way they try to blame him. He will have an answer. So, we've got a mighty God. A mighty God who created gives no room for all these false beliefs that sadly are a part of today because people want so badly to not believe in God that I believe this is why all of this is developed. They want so badly to have the right to control their own lives that they're looking for excuse to make it right. But again, every excuse, every mouth is silence. When we get to our fourth word in our Hebrew, it's not translated, so I can't point it to you in, in after we've created it before the heavens, but that's where it fits. It's a little
middle Chinese two two uh, Hebrew letters. In our English, it sounds like et, but it's olive, and it's the top. It's the beginning and the end. So God tells us He created. He's the master designer. He is the, the magnanimous God of this exquisite splendor of a creation. He shows his might. We talked about how he shows in the Hebrew himself as the faithful one who keeps oath. All of this from his name. And then it's as if he says in the next word, I'm it. I'm all. I'm everything. You have a need? I'm it. You have a desire? I'm it. You need wisdom? I'm it. You need guidance? I'm it. Whatever you need from beginning to end and even beyond because we know he is eternal. Before this, he created this. We know that he goes on forever. This is the God that's presented in the Hebrew. I mean, it's huge jumping off the page. And I'm sitting here thinking and saying to myself, Lord God, give me words because... What I'm saying isn't enough. It's falling short. I forgot to bring out also, when I brought out to you a bare sheet, I showed you the race, and uh, I talked about it being head or beginning. Um, many of you have heard Rosh Hashanah when they um, celebrate the new year. Rosh being the beginning of the new year. Well, here I bring it out now because I see again, he's the beginner of it all, the generator, the source. He has it all. It's all, I can't say it's all in his hands because it's beyond his hands, but he said the stars are his finger work. I think of when we make little finger sandwiches, just throw them together. <laughs> there are the stars in place. Sprinkles. Just sprinkles. I love like that. He sprinkled the stars in space. And that's our next part, is he created the heavens. And we will get into more about the stars. I gave you a, a good little synopsis last week, but we'll go into that in more detail in a number of different times when it's going to show up in our discussion. Uh, but I'll just move on right now and say he created the heavens. That's our next word in our English. In Hebrew, it is plural. It is the heavens. And this is talking about space. It's not talking about where God lives. It's not talking about his abode. It's not talking about our heavenly home. It's just basically talking about the heavens above our earth, the stratosphere, uh, the atmosphere. You know, it's just talking about that at this point. So what? Word. Um, I don't have it in front of me. That was the fourth word. Um, Shemayim, am I saying that right? Shemayim is heaven. Um, I know Mayim is waters. Um, I think it's Shemayim. I think. It has ha in front of it? Okay, ha is done. So it would be ha, the heavens. So there's your, your Hebrew word. And if you want me to keep going with the Hebrew, I'm going to have to pull up an interlinear because I'm not that good in my Hebrew. I wish I were. I have great books, I have great sources, and I had a great dad who helped me. But my dad is in heaven. I can't ask him any more questions. <laughs> um, okay, so we're looking at the creation of the universe now. We're looking at the creation of the stars. We're looking at the creation of the galaxies. We're looking at, and that's what we talked about last week, the scientific facts that just blew our minds that I won't go into now, that if you didn't get it, get my paper next week, and if you didn't hear it and you're only going to hear, get that CD because it was the just right universe, the just right creation, it was the distances, how many galaxies, I mean, we're not even a, a, a hair in this, and oh my goodness. Basically, philosophies and all that, they begin with man. And they try to work their way up to God. You know what God does? He starts with himself. And he comes down to man. That's what we get in the word of God. So in the beginning, this God who is faithful, the strong one, who exquisitely created, created the heavens, all the atmosphere, all that we see, and beyond what we can see, and beyond what we have explored. And he created the earth, the land. Eretz in Hebrew, okay, E-R-E-T-Z. When you hear them refer to Eretz Yisrael, 
as the land of Israel. Okay, just to, if you've heard that, it will help. Okay, so he has created the heavens and the earth. We have said it. I think we've stated it well. Have we covered it well? No. <laughs> but we have to move on. So I, I hope if I've done it, Lord help me, done justice to the start, but we'll go on. We're going to find out about this earth, and we're going to find out something very interesting right from the beginning. In our sentence, our next, uh, well, let's take our next phrase. We have the earth was formless and void, or the earth was without form and void. You may have some other words, uh, but it basically all means the same thing. Okay, <clears throat> keep that in mind. The earth was without form and void. Go with me to Isaiah. Go to Isaiah 45 and verse 18. Yeshia, Isaiah 45 and verse 18. I am in the complete Jewish Bible. Let's see if that one will do for me. I may have to go to the American. But, um, okay, I, let me go to my New American. I went to it in my other bit. Uh, I want the wording for you to understand, and I think you'll understand it better um, according to the Hebrew if I give it to you from the American Standard. The American Standard does try to stay very close to the Hebrew. Complete Jewish gives you the Jewish flavor. It's not always as um, close in wording as I would like, but it, the way it brings in the Jewishness and the, it gives you so much of the background and the, it fills it in, it colors it in well, so I like them both. Okay, Isaiah 45, 18 says, For thus is the Lord who created the heavens. Okay, we're on the same page, aren't we? Created Shemayim. He created the heavens. We've just studied that. He is the God who formed the earth and he made it. Okay, that was our second part in that we look at. God created the heavens and the earth. So, so far, Isaiah and Genesis are in complete agreement, are they not? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. And then it says, he established it and he did not create it, and you're either going to have a waste place, or he didn't create it vain, or he didn't create it void, or he didn't create it unformed. I've probably covered every translation that's out there. He's saying he did not create it without form. Wait a minute. Teacher, you said Genesis says the earth was without form and void. But Isaiah is saying it wasn't that way. Uh-oh, now so do we have a problem? <laughs> Did I just give you your first contradiction of scripture? Somebody Mormon say no. Say yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> Okay, no, there is no contradiction in scripture. What we have to do is get back to the roots of it because the translations are here to help us understand that when we look at something like this that looks like an exact clashing, then we go back to the original language and we look at it. So we go back to the Hebrew, go back with me to Genesis 1 because we'll look at it from Genesis 1. It's going to totally agree with what Isaiah just said. And we're going to see that that little word was in our Hebrew can be rendered instead of was, it can be rendered became. Now, there's a whole lot of difference between was and became. Became tells us something was before and something's after. Was just gives us past tense. It doesn't tell us that time in it. But we see that time when we look at the Hebrew word. The earth became formless. It became without void. It became without form. Now, when I go to the Hebrew words, and I'll put them up here for you, they are tohu bohu. Tohu is the first word. Ba is the connector. And sometimes you see that with a B, but it's basically an, and then bohu. And every vowel is long sounding. Tohu, the bohu. Okay? Tohu means formlessness, confusion, nothingness, void. Bohu means <coughs> emptiness, desolation. Translated without form and void. Okay? Without form and void. Now, Genesis 1, verse 2 uses tohu, the bohu. 
Isaiah 45:18 uses <coughs> tohu vavohu. They are both in 100% agreement in the Hebrew. It's our translation that gives us the confusion because our English can only give us past, present, and future. Greek gives us six tenses. I don't know how many are in Hebrew, but we see the, the, the stretching of the verbiage there in the Hebrew. What did you say the first word meant? The first word is formlessness, confusion, nothingness, or void. Any of those words. And bohu. You need some water, Pam? Or a cough drop? Maybe if someone's got one. She's drinking water. She is drinking water. And bohu is emptiness, <coughs> desolation, you would have without form and void. So without form would be bohu and void, desolation, nothing there, okay? So we see that there's an expression that's indicating something brought about a change. It, it wasn't created without form or void, but we know it became without form or void. We know that we have that from Genesis 1, 1. Okay, what we're looking at is, um, and let me let me bring up this one point also, the earth is the only thing, not the universe, that we're told was without form and void. And I'll ask you this question. If God created the heavens and the earth, and we're being told about it in one sentence. It sounds like it's being created at the same time. Wouldn't you expect either both of them to be without form and voice? Or neither of them? You don't really expect there to be like one is, is without form and void and the other is. It doesn't give room for that in the Hebrew. It sounds like it's speaking about both. The heavens were created without form and void or the heavens were created with form and void and not void. And the same for the earth. It's just one one little point of argument out of sight. So I'll put it that way. Okay? Now, there is a name given to this. As soon as I throw it out there, if you have been around and study, you're gonna it's gonna split and you're gonna be there's those on this side and there's those on this side, and there's good people on both sides. And again, I will bring to you what I see and what I understand, and you can make up your own mind. And I'm seeing smiles with those who I know know what I'm talking about. It is called the gap theory. The gap theory says that there is time that took place between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. Write it. Gap theory. If I put it in black, that might give a wrong connotation. I'm not trying to say yay or nay. Okay? Gap theory. A gap in time. Okay? We often see, well, I shouldn't say often, but there are times, plenty of times in Scripture where we will see a gap in time. We'll see a, a part fulfillment, a near fulfillment, a close fulfillment, and we'll see something that maybe even is yet to be fulfilled. Like when the Lord picked up the scriptures that were being read at that Shabbat when he went into the, the synagogue and he read that it was being fulfilled in their presence, he stopped and didn't finish the verse that said, and the day of vengeance of the Lord. Because the day of vengeance still hasn't come yet. That's the day of the Lord that we've studied about in the book of Revelation. The first part dealt with the Lord's first coming. The second part of the verse, and it's Luke 418 if you want to look at it later. The second part of the verse deals with his second coming. How much time is between the Lord's first coming and his second coming? At least. We're in 2020. I'll just round it out and just say at least 2020 years, okay? Because he wasn't born in, in 1 AD. Yeah. He was born before. So at <coughs> 2020 20 plus, okay? And we don't know how much more until that time starts ticking away again. So the idea that there is a gap in time is not foreign in Scripture. We see it in many different times. I think I've got some other examples to give you when I get down to it in my notes. But I'm, I'm kind of giving you the overview right now. Also, let me tell you that there's different views in the gap theory. In the gap theory, those that use this for time say this gives times for the scientific evidences that they have. Like they'll put the dinosaurs in there and they'll put the fossil <coughs> records in there and all of that. Now, there are those who believe in the gap theory that do not put all that into that time. They still have that along with the other animal creation, and they still have it really um, 
is believed by the others that <coughs> the dinosaurs and all went in extinct after the flood because of the change of the face of the earth. I'm not here to argue either of those points. I am here to say anytime science does not line up with the word of God, science has a problem, not the word of God. Our word of God does not tell us, thus saith God, this is when the dinosaurs existed. <laughs> thus says God, this is when this happened. I can just tell you, give science time, give archaeology time, they'll prove the word of God every time without fail. They'll either become the laughing stock of what they believe because they'll be shown to be so foolish or it will prove the word of God. So, we don't have God telling us exactly where they fit in and those who believe that the dinosaurs and all were lost through the flood will say, you know, we do not know how much the flood changed the shape of things. These fossils that are found all over the world, we have animals that were found up in the Arctic area with grass in their mouths that were eating grass that show a very quick, sudden death. Well, that fits well with the flood. Sudden that it came upon them and that it changed. The Arctic wasn't frozen before the flood. Now the Arctic has changed. That can change the scientific levels that show us the different ages. We don't know how much pressure it was. We don't know how much flooding it was. We just know it covered the face of the earth. So we can't answer unequivocally on either side with science to say, well, it had to be this way or it had to be that way. So there's room for differences of belief in here. But if you take it away totally and you say there is no gap at all between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2, then please explain to me what I do with Isaiah 45. that says God didn't create. And let me ask you this, which again is kind of a, a weaker argument because it's not scriptural, but it certainly makes sense to me. My God speaks and it happens. Now, can I see him create something chaotic? <coughs> something that needs to be improved? That says my God created something inferior. I don't see my God do anything inferior. I don't see him do anything part way. I see him do it all. So I have a very hard time just in my mental mind saying God could create chaos. Now, can he bring chaos through judgment on the face of the earth? Well, what was the flood? That was absolutely chaos on the face of the earth. And there had to been a world that began again after the flood. And we know the surface of the earth was changed radically from the flood. Well, I'm going to show you a time, I believe, from Scripture, of a judgment that came on the face of the earth that changed the shape of the earth into without form and void. Judgment <coughs> brought the, the destruction of what was perfectly created. Because, again, to me... To say God created chaos, God created something imperfect. That doesn't work well in my little psyche. But again, that's an argument out of silence. Let me show you before I go on to give you other proofs. Um, and by the way, the earth, the face of the earth, all science agrees, shows the marks of a catastrophe. Now, where you put that is how you answer that. Because there are those who just say, oh, well, that catastrophe has to be because of the flood. There are others who will say, well, we've got two different timings that are showing here. How do we correlate that? Well, if give me a little bit of time and you'll hear how I think we can correlate two different timings if science and their timing is right. Because we also know things like carbon-14 dating has been shown to be so far off the mark that I'm amazed science will still use it. But they I know. Don't. I'm sure okay. Spanish, it's the word order means um, order. order. Okay. Again, can you see God create anything without order? God is a God of order. Heaven is in order. I can't believe he created an earth out of order. But I can believe that he judged this earth, and it became without order, and then he brought a reorder, a restoration to it. And that's the view that I do stick with until um, I can be proven wrong. It is, if you want to know where I stand, yes, I do believe that there was a judgment that came. I'll show you that from Scripture. And that what we have in Genesis 1, 2.1 is that recreation, that restoration. 
when God brought order to it, and it's only then that God created man. So what I'm talking about happens pre-Adam. It's called pre-Adamic. Okay? It is not that it happened during man's time on this earth. I'm, I'll get that out there right away. Go ahead. Questions are good. If you, you know, we all have questions. Okay, when this is all going on now, and and the spirit of God is hovering above the earth, Satan is here. Um, if I answer your question, I'm going to tip my whole hand before I get out my evidence that I want to build my case. <laughs> Can I put your question on hold just like that? It will, it will be answered in this class. If it is not by the end of class, please bring it back up. And then I will tip my hand. But I want to build my case. Sure. You know how a good lawyer does it. In court, doesn't sell you everything up here, but just keeps you yeah. going. That's what I'd like to do. And, and then you can decide if I was a good lawyer or not. Yes, I just want to get clarification on the sure. position. You're saying from Genesis 1 1 to Genesis 1 2. There's something that there, happened there's in between. A, there's something that happened, mm -hmm. and there's, yes. there's no answer in this Bible? Oh, I believe there is an answer in this Bible. What happened between, between that, that time? And I will show you what I believe <coughs> is there, how I come at that, how I write at that, and then you make up your mind whether you agree or disagree. Okay? okay. Let me tell you also, just to prove my point of tohu tohu, because again, I like two or three witnesses, let a thing be established. Remember, never take one verse and build a whole out of one verse. If you can't find it balanced in scripture, you're likely not quite on target. <laughs> Tohu Babohu is used uh, again <coughs> in Isaiah, still the same author, but it's used in Isaiah 34, 11. Let's look at that real quickly. Isaiah 34, 11. If you kept Isaiah open, you just flip back a few. And there we read in verse 11, A horned owl and a hawk will possess it. Screech owl and raven will live there. He will stretch over the measuring line of confusion and the plumb line of the empty void. This is the judgment on Babylon that comes at the end when the Lord returns at, at, um, in the battle of Armageddon. And you notice how the last words are the empty void? That's Tohuba Vohu. God is saying Babylon's going to be desolate. Babylon's going to be in confusion. Babylon's not going to, no one's going to live there except a screech owl and a hawk and a horn and a <laughs> horned owl. I knew that word was in there somewhere. Isaiah 34, 11. Yes, Isaiah 34, 11. Okay, do you have a different word? Whatever word you have at the end of your verse, in the Hebrew, that's where Tadu Kabohu is there. Now, let me give you another author apart from Isaiah. Go to Jeremiah. You're a man. Okay, Jeremiah, we're going to go to Jeremiah 4. It's just the next book. If you don't know your books in order, just go uh, one more book from Isaiah. Genesis, uh, Genesis. Jeremiah 4, verse 23. Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 23. Both of these are prophets who knew their Hebrew. They spoke their Hebrew. It was their given language. And Jeremiah says, I looked at the land. It was unformed and void. In the sky, it had no light. Okay, and he's going on, he's talking about what he's talking about. But right there, it was unformed and void. It was tohu the vogu. The same thing that in your King James, if you use King James, it said without form and void in Genesis 1 2. So Genesis, twice in Isaiah, once in Jeremiah, are all using tohu the vogu, and they're all saying it means without form and void. Okay? Now, what happened? If this is true, is there any evidence in Scripture? Because we want to look internally for our answer. Do we see any indication anywhere in Scripture that something happened on the face of the earth that could fit into this time? But go with me to Isaiah. We're going to stick with our prophet Isaiah. We're going to go to Isaiah 14. And we'll start with verse 12. Now, the same way that I told you earlier, Isaiah 14, repeat it, verse 12, the same way I told you earlier that we see in the scriptures sometimes a close fulfillment and a far fulfillment. And let me give you just to, to lay that basis down um, rather than do it with my tablet. Yeah, you're going to go to Isaiah 14, 12. Hold there, stay there, don't, don't flip over. Let me read to you what I already told you because I decided I really shouldn't look for that. Luke chapter 4 is recording what happened in Yeshua's life. 
Yeshua went into the synagogue, the synagogue every week, they are reading a portion of scripture. They read a portion from the Tanakh, I'm sorry, from the Torah, the first five books. They go through all those five books in one year. They repeat it. They go in order. But they read a portion also called the Hoth Torah. That means it comes after the Torah. The Torah is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Hoth Torah is the area that has all of your prophets. It has, you know, all these other books. And they don't read them in order. They read portions. Every week, all around the world, wherever you're Jewish and you plug in, you're reading the same portion that you're told what to read. And they skip around. Okay? When Yeshua went in the synagogue at this time, that is recorded to us by Luke, he picked up and he read the portion of the scripture that was being read at that time. This is what he read. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now, who would that be talking about? Jesus. Yeshua. Jesus. So he's reading what he knows is being fulfilled. The Spirit of the Lord is on him because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of the sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Okay? And he closed the book. He sat down, and that means, you know, he's done reading that portion, and they're going to discuss it. What he didn't do was read the last <coughs> sentence that was in there. What we have here is a quote from Yeshaya, because remember, they're reading Isaiah, because they're reading a Hoftor portion, so let me run over to Isaiah and tell you what he was reading. Luke gave us exactly what he said and where he stopped. Isaiah gives us where what was the rest that he stopped before he read. And by the way, everything that I read there, I think you'll agree, is what the Lord did. All of that, that example, preach the gospel to the poor, heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of the sight to the blind, set at liberty those who are bruised. We know the Lord did that in his earthly life here on this earth. Now, 61 of Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, let me read it for you. It starts out, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Am I reading the same thing? Yes. 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 So you know I'm not making this up. The Lord was reading. Remember, Luke wasn't written yet. The Lord didn't pick up the book of Luke. He picked up the scroll from Yeshia, from Isaiah. Turned to the portion they were reading that week and said, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord's anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Is that the same? No. Do we know without a shadow of a doubt he was reading Isaiah 61? Okay. And then verse 2, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. I read that to you out of Luke. But that's not the end of verse 2. It's not the end of the sentence. It says, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all of mourn. Well, the day of vengeance of our God is the tribulation. We know it's called the day of God's wrath, the outpouring of his wrath. It's vengeance on sin, on the unjustness that has been on this earth for so long that God's cup is finally full. And he says, enough, I'm going to judge it. But the Lord stopped there. He didn't read that part. Why? Because that part is still yet to come. And he read and said to them, this part has been fulfilled in your ears today. He didn't say the other part's been because it hasn't been. So here's my proof of how we can see in one verse, 2,000 years split. There's nothing to stop us from seeing that in Scripture. And this is not the only exception. It's just the only one I'm going to take time to show you right now. So keeping that in mind, we're going to look now at Isaiah 14. We're going to start with verse 12, and we're going to see that we're talking about um, Lucifer here. I'm going to take you in another scripture that's going to relate, and it's going to be talking about the king of Tyre. Tyre is a place on the face of this earth, and the reason why I'm telling you that ahead of time is the same way we have this split, we also often see, especially in prophetic scripture, that there'll be someone that closely fits the bill but doesn't fulfill it all, and that's called a near fulfillment, and there'll be a greater or a far fulfillment. 
We see that repeatedly. If you went through the book of Revelation with me, I brought that out a number of different times to you. Um, the easiest to see for people who have studied is if you know the scriptures that spoke and they saw Antiochus Epiphanes in it and what he did. And they say, oh, it was fulfilled by Antiochus Epiphanes. But if you read it in its fullness, you realize, no, that the Antichrist is going to fulfill it completely. Antiochus was the type of the Antichrist. And that's another reason why if he came out of the Iran area, it's very likely that the Antichrist will come out of the Iran area because then the picture is being drawn for us. So keeping that in mind when we get to our other scripture, you'll see a near, but there's a greater fulfillment. But let's look first at just <coughs> Isaiah 14, 12. How have you fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn? You have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. Okay, I'm going to stop right there and ask, does anyone know who this could be describing? Satan. Satan. Good, good. You're all educated. You're all like this. Very good. Okay. Satan has fallen from heaven. He was called the day star or the star, the morning star. Although really in Hebrew it's more the shining one, but it gives the idea that he shined brighter than the others. That was more, you know, like a head. You know, he was above others. Okay. He's been cut down to the earth. He's the one who's weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, even when he was cut down, he's still saying it. I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the Mount of Assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Aye, aye, aye. Exactly. Aye, 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 aye. We've got I, I this year, and I can fall. It's his fault. It's what brought him down. It's that pride. Nevertheless, verse 15 tells us that you will be thrust down to Sha'ol to the recesses of the pit. And remember, Sha'ol has a holding tank for the evil, not just paradise side. It also has the suffering side. That's the, it, we call it hell. Okay? Those who see you will gaze at you. They will ponder over you saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble? Who shook kingdoms? Who made the world like a wilderness and overthrew its cities? Who did not allow his prisoners to go home? All the kings of the nations lie in glory, each in his own tomb, but you've been cast out of your tomb like a rejected branch, clothed with the slain who are pierced with the sword, who go down to the stones of the pit like a trampled corpse. Whoa. And you know, rightfully so. When we see Satan in his end and his demise, we will look at him and say, you are the one that troubled us. We'll see him in the position that he's really in. So we know this is talking about Lucifer. There is a time that he had this pride that he was lifted up and he suffered consequences because of it. Some of it completely fulfilled, some of it partially fulfilled at this point. Um, I went back too far. Where's verse 12? Okay, but we know he's been cut down. We know that, that something has happened here that showed he's lost the presence that he had. He's lost the control that he had, the... the position he had. That's a better word. He yeah. lost the position he had. Okay? Do we see anything in scripture that can tell us about that? Because this doesn't give us enough yeah, alone. But I'm building my case. I'm bringing you a complete picture. So now go with me to Hezekiel, Ezekiel, chapter 28. And this is where we're going to talk about the king of Tyre. But we're going to see that it goes far beyond the king of Tyre. Ezekiel 28, and we're going to start with verse 12. Ezekiel 28 and verse 12. It starts out telling us it's talking about the king of Tyre. Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre. What's the lamentation? A dirge, a mourning, a sad, M-O-U-R-N, mourning, okay, yeah. The lamentations that Yomir wrote, he's weeping, he's crying because the judgment that they're going to endure because they won't turn. So this is, this is coming against the king of Tyre, but we realize this does not fit an earthly man. King of Tyre never is going to be able to have done everything we're going to read here. So we know he's a type, but there's a picture of someone greater. And I've already took my end, you know, that I believe it's showing us a picture of Satan. But we'll, we'll go through it and see if you see it also. Okay? And Satan is the easy way to say Satan. Thus says the Lord God. 
Okay, the Lord <coughs> is speaking, so this I know is true. You had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. How did God create Satan? Mm -hmm. Ugly horns, no. tail, no. devil. No. 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 He was beautiful. He was full of wisdom because he was in the very presence of wisdom. I was ignoring it. <laughs> For the sake of the video, I went right past. 28, 28, we start with verse 12. Okay? He was perfect in beauty. Satan was beautiful. Remember, I don't believe God creates chaotically. I don't believe God creates ugly. God prays beautiful. Now, you may look at some people today and say, you can see I am a holder. <laughs> but watch what you're saying because you're talking against the one that created. <laughs> I'm sorry? He's perfect. He is. Yes. And he, he, he loves it all. Yeah. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And the beholder is our God. Okay, so what happened? You were in Eden the garden of God. Okay? Now, let me just say here, we know, well, I'll go on. I'll go on. Remind me to come back to that if I don't later. Okay? You were in Eden. Don't forget that. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was recovering. The ruby, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper. He's gorgeous. All of this beauty is all around him also. The lapses and lazuli, I don't know how to say it, the turquoise, the emerald, the gold, the workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were the anointed cherub who covers. That means he was appointed. He had a, a, a position. He was created a cherub. Cherub is an angel, okay, who covers, who is, is over, has a covering. He's over an area. I placed you there. We know God's talking, okay? I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. Now remember, he was in the garden of God. He was in, what did it say? You were in Eden, the garden of God. Yeah, that should be jumping out at you. Genesis 2. It's not, you know, it should be in your radar there, okay? You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. He's named those stones. The rubies, the jewels, do you see the fire? You know, it doesn't mean literally fire, something's on fire and burning up, but we, we say sapphire is fire. You know, we say it's beautiful. That's the way it's meant. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created. See, God didn't create him with blame. God didn't create him faulty. God created him beautiful and created him perfectly. But from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. What is unrighteousness? Well, let's look at what righteousness is. Righteous is holiness. It is a holy standard of our holy God. We are to be righteous. We are to do righteous acts. We know we don't. We fall short. Every time we fall short, we call it sin. We're told by Isaiah, all our righteousness, all we can do that we think is so righteous and so great and so holy and so pure and so clean and so good, is filthy rags. That means it's missed that mark. So unrighteousness found in him is missing the mark of the holy God. Mm -hmm. It is the sin, it's specifically that we see, the sin of pride. Right. I, 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 I'm going to raise myself up. I don't want to worship you, God. I'm going to be the one that's going to worship. Basically, he's wanting to dethrone God. He's wanting to claim God's whole creation for himself. <laughs> The day that entered into, whether he has a heart or whatever he has, the day that entered into his fiber, into his very being, is the day that he became unrighteous. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence and you sinned. Therefore, I ca have cast you as profane from the mountain of God. He's been cast out from the mountain of God. I have destroyed you, O covering chair, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I put you before kings that they may see you. And remember in Isaiah how they see him? This thing, this is what did this. By the multitude of your iniquities, in the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuaries. Therefore, I brought fire from the midst of you, as consumed you, and I have turned you to ashes on the earth, 
in the eyes of all who see you. The beauty has gone to ashes. We see that there has been a major change. We see that something happened. Now, if you follow me for a moment, he was walking among all these beautiful jewels. Everything was gorgeous. Okay? The garden of God was gorgeous. It had sparkling, fiery gems, jewels, and all of that all over the face of this earth. The garden of God. Eden. Where do we find those now? Are they on the surface? No. Underneath. We have to mine them out, don't we? They're inside. Something must have happened that took those jewels from the outside and put them inside. Now, Pastor Frederick may be rested in peace, and he is because he's in the presence of our holy God. <laughs> Said, are you telling me God turned the world inside out? <laughs> okay, maybe I am. Maybe not exactly, but in some way it turned inside out in some way, so that the jewels that were gorgeous on the scene, on the surface, me, are now in the mines that need to be mined out. Something cataclysmic happened. Yeah, but also, could be, see, Karen cannot see sin. So that means that they had to, because it was created by God, that had to be hidden. Well, except the jewels weren't the sin. The pride no, no, was no, 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 but, but because of Satan. Well, his, his kingdom got judged. <laughs> the same way that we're going to see the Antichrist's kingdom gets judged. Anyone who comes up against God all the way through Scripture, their kingdom gets judged. Now, when we fast forward and we get to chapter 6 through 9, we get to the flood. We're going to see that after the flood, God says, I'll never do this again. Mm -hmm. Did he say this is the only time I've ever used water to cover? Mm -hmm. No. No. So, it very easily could be that God was saying, I judged the heavenly kingdom in this way. I judged the earthly when man was there in this way, but I will never judge in this way again. So, very easily we can see, because we've got in Genesis 1, waters over the face of the earth. How did the waters get there? If the waters are judgment with the flood, why are not the waters of Genesis 1-2 judgment from God bringing judgment on the face of this earth that was Satan's kingdom? This was his domain. He walked up and down this earth. He had entry into heaven because he wasn't fully kicked out and really isn't even yet. I mean, we know it and we're told prophetically, but we know he's up there today saying, Look at Rochelle. Look at look at look at that that one that, that you know she tries to be so good. Look at what she's doing, and thankfully, the Lord steps in between Amen. and says, "I covered that with blood. It's been washed away. I can't even see that." And God says, "I see her perfect." Okay, but we know Satan's still countering. We know he's still arguing. We know the day will come in Revelation. We read it. And he's literally cast out of heaven and does not have access into heaven and takes out his anger on the earth, specifically on the chosen people who keep the commandments of God and those who have the testimony of prophecy. What's the testimony of prophecy? Yeshua Jesus. That's the whole sum of prophecy. If I give you prophecy in one word, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Yeshua. Yeah. So these are the ones he's going after in anger because he knows his time is now very short. And so he's going to go with a vengeance. What has he been doing all along? If earth was his kingdom, and he lost his kingdom, it got judged. God recreated it the way we're told, brings the order that we see, and puts man on it, says, man, this is your kingdom. Well, what's Satan going to do? I had it first. I want it back. I'm going to go after that man, and I'm going to get in to him and get back, get control. And that's what we see happen. He goes after Adam because he wants his kingdom back. He wants his authority back. He wants his role and his reign back. And sadly, in essence, 
our human parents handed it over to him because who is the God of this era right now? Who is the prince of principalities of darkness in high places? Now, who's higher? Who's greater? Who has allowed this to go for a time and a purpose, but who's going to pull it up short? And who is going to establish his kingdom on earth? That will be done in heaven and it is on earth. So, it's a time. It's a process. But does that all fit? Do we see a judgment here? How did the, the precious gems get to the inside? How did we get water on the face of the earth? Is water judgment in scripture? Yes, go through scriptures and you'll see time and again, water is judgment, water is judgment. Many a times you will see it. When you remember Genesis 2.8 says that the name of this earth was Eden. Because, and I'll read it and rather than get to my tablets real quickly, I'm going to just look over here and read for you. Yeah, you probably could get there faster than I can. <laughs> Genesis 2.8 is telling us, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he took the man whom he had formed. So God made a garden in Eden, and he put man there. Well, what did we read about um, Satan? Was it in Isaiah? Was it in, is it in, is it in Ezekiel? You were in Eden, the garden of God. So do we have the same earth? Do we have the Eden? I think we do. What I'm basically saying to you is I think God originally called Earth Eden. Mm -hmm. Then he called it Earth when he recreated and put <coughs> man there. And Satan recognized his own territory that was his because God didn't zap and that's gone and create something totally new. He recreated. He brought judgment and now he's bringing out of that judgment what we have recorded for the restoration of the earth. Yes. Okay. So, when Satan was here and he had the earth, mm -hmm. he wasn't alone, right? No, because he was over others. So, were those <coughs> the angels that left with him? It, it's likely, but I don't know if it, if it was only that maybe those who were on this earth who were under him but saw him to be the wicked one he was and did not side with him were not told. So I can't say. Yeah, because each angel that went with him made that choice. Yeah. So, so in don't... scripture does it say that the angels went with him? That the third of the angels, yes. We get that in Revelation 12, 9. And I'll take you over there real quickly and show you. I say quickly, but i got to get my tablet to <laughs> do it. Revelation chapter 12. In verse 9. And these are all very good questions. Ask your questions. Think it through. See if you can find a, a hole to pull out our, you know, because if so, then we'll let it go. Isn't there also a reference in Luke? Uh, well, not Luke, but Jesus says the references that I saw. Yes. I think it's Luke. I want to say Luke 24. Um, but Revelation also has it where the, they saw the star fall. Revelation, the start of the chapter, is it 16 or am I too far? Um, where, where they saw the star fall from heaven, and, and some people don't believe that it is Satan, but there's good proof to look at it and believe that it could have been also. Uh, it's not 16. Uh, let me see. I, I, can, I can almost get it. I don't want to take too much time. I might let you look it up, somebody. Especially if I can't get my phone, let me Google. There we go. Okay. Star fall from heaven. That's where we're going to go. And I'm going to explain 12.9 in just a minute. Star fall from heaven in Revelation 6, 13. I went to 16. Let's go to chapter 6. Chapter 6 and verse 13. No, 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 that's not the one I wanted. That's not what I thought 6 was too early. Okay. 
12 9 is what we're going to discuss in a minute. I've just gotten sidetracked and I'm looking for the star that falls from heaven. I think it's when the trumpets blow. Um, I just thought this one. I don't think so. No, because I know where we are in 12 3. We'll talk about all of that too, but it's not 12 3. Um, keep looking, somebody, because like I say, I want to move on for the sake of the, the video. Um, Revelation 9 1, I think. Nine. Okay, thank you. Revelation 9 1 says, The fifth angel sounded the fifth trumpet. I remember my trumpets, just not which one. I saw a star fall from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Well, that's not Satan there, then, because the key was given to this one. But there is an illusion. I'll have to see if I can find it, unless it is the confusion of Revelation 9 where it is fully. But sticking even without that, I'll, I'll give you enough proof. Well, let's look at Revelation 12, 9 now. Okay, the great dragon um, was thrown down. Yeah, and it's going to tell you here. It, this is talking about the war that took place in heaven. Okay, if we look up at verse 3, another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. His tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Okay, so the dragon's tail took a third of the stars to the mm -hmm. earth, and we know that when we're talking in imagery here in Revelation, the stars, we're talking about the angels, we're not talking yeah. about the little stars that you see at night, which aren't so little, but you know what I'm saying, that this in, in the, we'll look up above, you've got um, verse 1, on her head crowned 12 stars. That was representing the 12 tribes. We have symbolic language being spoken here. So we have the dragon taking a third of the stars with him from heaven down to earth. Look at verse 9 now. If you wonder if I make things up when I tell you the dragon is Satan, Satan, yes. let me tell you where I get it. If you read then to the end of verse 9, if you have any doubt, I don't know where your mind is. The great dragon who was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil, and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth. So who's the dragon? Satan. I mean, it, that one spells it out. Okay. So he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels thrown down with him. What angels were thrown down with him? Verse 3. The third of the angels that were cast down with him. I'll go to Reddit, and then I'll go on with that. When he took those angels by his tail, were they willing to go with him when they eat? Yes, yes, yeah. because God would so never so condemn any yeah. well, to... This is the devil. He yes. has this. Right. Okay. The same way though. the devil can, no one yes. can say that, that they end up in hell because of Satan. They can't say, well, God, you didn't give me a chance. Satan did it to me. The devil made me do it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, the same way you can't say that, that the third that he took were the third that wanted to follow him. Anyone who did not would have been free to free themselves and not be a part of it. Um, the imagery of the dragon sweeping with his tail is, is just, again, to give you a symbolic picture. It isn't that he really looked like a dragon and his tail knocked out, and if you were in his way, boom, he went down. No, but it, it's showing a third went with him. A third were caught in his vice. A third were caught in the power of his tail, or the, the power that's in the tail. Our yeah, okay, so in this gap theory, you have a point of view. And this particular one here is um, about him falling. So at this point, chronologically, he fell first, and God gave him this kingdom, this Eden kingdom. When did that I think, happen? I think he had this kingdom. I think that was what he was doing when pride was lifted up in him. Okay, so he, he was allowed to stay. He's allowed in the, our atmosphere still. The kingdom was taken from him. Earth was taken from him. Eden was taken from him. It was given back to him when Adam, Adam and Eve yeah. fell. Uh, when it. they so gave, I was looking for it. Yeah, yeah, when they gave it. The war that's taken place in heaven, we know that the war is, is, is both past and future, if you can understand that. We know that that Satan came up, that he, that he lifted up in his pride and wanted it to dethrone God. But we also know that we'll see it in a greater fulfillment in the future. But I believe when he was lifted up, he, was, he had this whole kingdom. God gave him the earth. 
You know, we've got all kinds of planets out here. We don't know what God was doing with all of them. Because remember, I'm going to show you there are times in our recreation that we're told that God created. And there are other times that it says God made. When gives you an idea that he on the spot is creating out of nothing. Like when he creates man. He didn't refurbish man. He didn't take something that was there and, and redo it. He created. He did a new act when he created man. But we don't always read everything that was created in those six days with that Hebrew word that's created out of nothing. We have the word made that's made out of a substance. That could be that he's bringing them into play in a way with this earth now. And we'll see that with the cosmos. We'll see that with the planets. That they could have been there a whole lot longer than we realize. This earth could be very old. Man can't be. But this earth can be. So even though I think they're way off when they come up with their 50 million years, <laughs> it still doesn't, the earth I'm sure is older than 6,000 years. Man 6,000 years on the earth. But if it was Satan's kingdom, if he was down here enjoying himself, we kind of see a, a similar way God put Adam and Eve in the garden to enjoy how long were they there before they ate what they weren't supposed to? We don't a know. A day? No. no. I can tell you for one thing, Adam was there long enough. He named all the animals. And he got loneliness. Every animal had a partner, but he didn't. I don't think that happened day one of his creation. I think there was a bit of time. How long did the two of them enjoy the Eden, the garden of God that he put man in? We don't know. But once they succumbed, they gave back the role to Satan. We know that that's the battle of the ages. Remember the seal? The, I'm sorry, the deed. The scroll. The scroll in the hand of God. Okay? Revelation. Revelation. Um, I'm not sure. uh, five. Revelation 5. Revelation 5. I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. Strong angel. One of the archangels probably. One of the ones who's over others. He's a strong angel. And he cries out, who's worthy to open the scroll and the loose seals? And no man in heaven on earth, under the earth, was able to open the scroll, neither to look on it. And I, John, I wept. I cried because no man was found worthy to open it, to read the scroll, neither to look on it. This was devastating. What is so important about this scroll that John is so devastated he's crying because no one can open it. And what does it mean to open it? Just take it and read it? No. The one who is allowed to break those seals to open it is the one who owns it. The one who has it. And as we keep reading, we find out that's the grant deed to the earth. The Lord bought it back. How did he buy it back? By his blood. That's how he bought it back. He redeemed it from mankind. The same way he redeemed mankind, he has redeemed the planet back from mankind. And the proof of it is where does he put his millennial kingdom? Does he put it in some other galaxy somewhere else? No. We know that he puts it where he put his name. On that one spot, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city of our great. That's what he did. He bought it back. We have our whole story that we're seeing in here. But why did he have to buy it back? Why do we see this one who takes it? And, and let's look. Let's read it real quick. Let's look at this description. And what verse? When, verse 5 now of Revelation 5. And one of the elders said to me, Weep not. Stop crying, John. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed to open the scroll, scroll and to loose its seven seals. The lion is the most majestic. In the power that the lion shows power, he's able to redeem. But notice the description doesn't stay with the lion. Behold, I, I, and I, John, beheld. And lo, in the midst of the throne, and the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb. Wait a minute. We just said lion. Now we see the lamb. And this lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth, and he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. So even though 
Yohan, John is told it's the lion of the tribe of Judah who's got it. Who's the one who in action goes and takes it? Mm. The lamb. The lamb. Why didn't the lion? Because it's the lamb that sheds blood, mm. that purchased the deed mm. that has the right to open it. Mm. And as he opens it, his glory comes out. He is the lion who mourns. He is the lion who is majestic. The lamb as if he'd been slain because he's raised from the dead in that glory, resurrection, power. That it took being a lamb it took being the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. What a picture. Look at the beauty of Scripture, and in the same way that it draws these pictures with the Lion and the Lamb, I see also our picture here in the beginning. And I think with Isaiah 12, with Ezekiel 28, we're seeing what happened in time past, not all the way past where God was, because God at some point created, and he made that very clear, I created this anointed cherub. I created him. Satan is not God's opposite. He's not God's equal. He is no. not omniscient. He no. is not omnipresent. He is not all power. None of that. That means he can't be everywhere at once. He can't see everything at once. And he doesn't have power equal to God. He is lesser than God. But he raised himself up and he said, this kingdom isn't enough for me. I'm going to go up into the Most High and I'm going to sit on the Most High's throne and I'm going to receive praise. What does the Antichrist do? I'm going to sit on the throne in the temple that's supposed to be the temple of God. It's not that it's supposed to be. I'm going to sit there and the whole world is going to worship me. Who wants to be worshipped? Satan. Who's indwelling the Antichrist at that point? Satan. He's finally getting the worship. I'm in him. I'm entering into man. I'm taking over man because man got my kingdom. Man got what was mine. I want it back. Yeah, I'm throwing a hissy fit, and I think <laughs> the audacity, I can win. Well, I have news for him. Mm -hmm. Genesis 3.15 tells us, the one who you crush his heel is going to smack, crush your head. A crushed head is dead. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, he is the father of life. That's all he is. That he even lies to himself. Yes, he even lies to himself. He even is so caught up in his own mind that he thinks that he can do this. Okay, um, let me give you a couple other thoughts to think through. We know Satan spoke through the serpent. In Genesis 3, we'll look at it in detail. Okay? Now, two things. One, he didn't say, oh, I talked the serpent. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Pardon me, hit my mic. <laughs> but very likely, the animal kingdom suffered the consequences of sin also. And speech in some form was taken from them. Can they still communicate to us today? Yes. You ever own the dog? <laughs> you know what the dog's thinking. The dog knows what you're thinking. Or a kitty. <laughs> Even in other other animals, you see the thought. You see it in birds. You see it in a little hamster, a little rat sometimes. Yeah. My sister has become mama <laughs> to a, a um, hamster that's a, a mini one. I forget what they call it. But a dwarf. A dwarf hamster. The reason why she's mama to this is because she's an administrator of a preschool. The preschool, two of the classes, each had a hamster this little hamster in this little cage and one weekend when they were going to be gone for a long time the teacher that normally took this one home couldn't and Ruth was there and said well I'll take it <laughs> well Ruth didn't take the cage and leave the cage sitting she took the cage home and she opened it up and she took out the little guy and she talked to him and she petted him and Believe it or not, a little relationship they started. It. They bonded. That is the little hamster. This is the little, I mean, it is darling when you look at it, but you don't know it's got so much personality. Well, the end of that long week comes, Ruth takes the hamster back, puts it back into the classroom for the little children, and a couple days later, she happened into the classroom to talk to the teacher. And 
of course she sees her little hamster, and, and I don't remember his name now. Forgive me. Uh, Rex? I think it's Rex. We'll call him Rex. Uh, she and my sister's very, if you think I'm demonstrative, she's got more. <laughs> right, Barbara? <Yeah. laughs> Barbara knows her well. <laughs> She's on her way to the teacher, but she sees the little hamster cage, and she just, Hi, Rex, how are you doing? And she's on her way to the teacher, and Rex comes out, and he gets on his little wheel, and he's going around and around, and the yeah. teacher is shocked. <laughs> and she looks at Ruth, you know, and says, Well, how's Rex? And Ruth, the teacher says, Rex has been depressed. <laughs> and Ruth says, What? A hamster's depressed? Okay. How do you know a hamster's depressed? Well, this little guy has chosen to hide from the children Aww. for two and a half days, has not come out, has Aww. not played on his wheel, has not been eating. He's been hiding in his little, what's, what's his little abode, yeah. and that's all where he's been. But look at him now. He's going to town, and he's all excited because he heard Ruth's voice. And teacher talked with the children that afternoon and said, I think our hamster needs to go home with Miss Ruth. <laughs> and she is now the mama to this little hamster. <laughs> That's a hamster. How does that hamster obviously have feeling and emotion, understood loneliness? He missed his little buddy. <laughs> he picked Ruth. <laughs> I don't want to be leaguer the, be leaguer the point, but Roger has a dog that chose him. Went through two other owners, but absolutely insisted that he belong, she belongs to Roger. And if you ever want to see the way I hope I show love to my Savior and adoration, the way I want to sit at my Savior's feet, you should see this dog. <laughs> she lives for every moment with him, worships the ground he walks on, is in despair when he's gone, <laughs> and just lights up in his presence. Oh, God, let me be like that with you. I want to be a little puppy dog at his feet. I want to just adore him and love him. I got off, but the point is, the serpent spoke before. We see that this serpent had ability. It's not anything strange to believe that these other, what we are saying, it was not a world where a serpent didn't speak, apparently. We know that <coughs> Satan got into Peter, into his mind anyway, when in Matthew, Peter's trying to stop the Lord. No, mm -mm, I'm not going to let you go to the cross. Cut over my dead body. <laughs> and got a, Yeshua and Jesus had to say to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. He didn't say, get thee behind me, Peter. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. So we see Satan is able to work in these different ways. So to believe what we are saying, it all comes together. Satan is addressed through another at different times in Scripture. Also, God is light. When he creates, he cannot create darkness because he's light. Darkness is a sign of his judgment when we read of darkness in scripture. And I'll give you just a few real quickly. There are several that have been popping out at me ever since I started studying this. But let me just take you to the ones I gave you cross-references for. Matthew 27, 45, and 46. Matthew, I'm trying to stay on the, the um, video, so I'm going back to my... I'm supposed to be back to my tablet. My tablet is frustrating if you haven't noticed. It's not fast enough for me. <laughs> Matthew 27, 45, and 46. But I think it gives you a chance to catch up with it. Okay, we are in the crucifixion scene. We are in the time when the Lamb of God is shedding his blood for the forgiveness of our sin. Matthew 27, Matthew 27, verses 45 and 46. It is on your papers. I'm not off your papers right now. Brian, did I do that to you? But right now I'm on. Okay. In the midst of his being on the cross, we've come to the sixth hour. Notice what it says. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. For three hours, there is an unusual darkness. This isn't that it's midnight to three in the morning. No. The, the sixth hour is about three in the afternoon. From three to six p.m., there is a darkness. About the ninth hour, Yeshua and Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama 
up to me. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? See, at that moment in time when he's crying that out is when the act is being completed. He has become the sin offering. He has taken on the sin of the world. And our holy God in heaven, Jehovah our Father, cannot look on sin. So he's had to turn his back on the sin, not on his son, but it felt to his son in his humanity like he was being forsaken. What he promised he would never do to us. Five different ways in Greek tells us he will never forsake us, never, uh, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Five different ways to say no in Greek and all five are used in that verse. He's promised I'll never let you feel what I feel, but in his humanity he felt the darkness of the separation, and I think God allowed the darkness as the judgment on what the world was doing, causing his death to be another layer to show them something is happening here. It's so magnanimous, and it's happening not in a glorified way, but in a necessary way that he is allowing darkness to fall on the face of the, this earth. Darkness, man doesn't, we don't like the darkness. I mean, our, when their deeds are evil, they like the darkness. But otherwise, darkness is looked at as a curse. It's not looked at as something good. Go with me to Revelation 16.10, the fifth vial that's poured out. Revelation 16.10. And let's read, whoops, let's read just what it says about the darkness there. This is a time coming when God is pouring out his wrath. Well, if you don't think God's wrath was being poured out, not on the whole earth, but at this time, at this moment, when his son is going through, the, and not just because it was excruciating physically, but the more excruciating, becoming sin, becoming the sin, um, the sin sacrifice. How can holy God, I mean, when we get close to the Lord, sin grieves us. Sin sickens us. He's, he's having to drink the whole cup, so to speak. And remember, that's what he was praying in Gethsemane. Let this cup pass from me. He wasn't saying, don't let me have to suffer the pain of crucifixion. He was talking about the cup of God's wrath, the cup of, of sin that, that he was drinking, that we won't have to drink it. Because it would kill us. The wages of sin is death. This is what he was doing. That was the agony. He knew he was going to become a sin offering, taking the sin of the world, and it had to horrify the holy part of God. It, it had to have. I can't understand it. I can't fathom it, and I can't tell you I can totally understand it. I can't. But I'll take it because God said it. And I'll believe it because God said it. And once again, God is greater than my mind. God is greater than anything that I can fully understand. I'm still trying to understand the heavens on earthly terms. I can't wait till I get home. Yeah. And I got a mind that's like the Messiah's that will enable me to understand. And you know what we're going to do when they're there? We think we've been drinking deep. I think we're going to laugh. And we're going to say, huh, we were in the shallow end. We were on the first step. We had a clue what all God had yet for us when we get there. Ah, can't wait. Ah, Revelation 16.10. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened. What was this darkness like? Was it just that it was nighttime? No. They gnawed their tongues because of pain. They're chewing on their own tongues because the darkness is so thick, so palpable, that it's horrifying them, that it's putting them into pain. The closest I can get to understand it, when I was a very little girl, we went into, I think it was a Carlsbad Caverns, and there is a point where they warn you that they're going to turn out their lights, and for a split second, you're going to know what darkness is. And I was a very little girl. I was a nine at the most. I was in my daddy's arms where I felt safe and secure. I left my dad. He was holding on to me. That light went out, and I still to this moment remember feeling like I got gripped. It was so horrifying. 
I, if I hadn't been my daddy's aunt, I probably would have freaked. And I was not one given to that. I was not a high-strung little paranoid. In fact, I was calming others down often when I would be in a situation. That I remember it, it, it grabbed hold of you. It, it was personified. And that was just a split second before they put the lights back on. And I thought, wow. I mean, I didn't think then, but God has used that so much as a spiritual lesson in my life to even bring it to you today. Darkness is judgment of God, and it's horrifying. Let me take you to Shmuk, to Exodus, chapter 10, and verse 21, Exodus. Now, let me tell you also, because we don't have time, we're right here at the end of class, um, that Isaiah speaks of this kind of darkness, and he speaks of it as judgment of God. Um, there are, I'm sure, so many. Job speaks of it also. There are, there are many, many examples. I've given you a couple, but I could give you more and more proof. Um, I won't take the time because I'm running out of time. But Exodus chapter 10, I've got us back at the time of slavery. I've got us back at the time when God is coming with the plagues against Pharaoh. Every god that Pharaoh's people worship, well, not every one of them, but, but every plague was against one of the gods of, of Egypt. They had more gods than the, the nine, so that's why I can't say every god. But, yeah, yeah they, they worshiped everything. Remember pantheism, gods and everything? That's where they were. They worshiped everything. Exodus chapter 10, I want to take us down to verse 21. Okay? This is... Um, I don't remember which judgment is. I want to say, I think it's ninth. Is it ninth? Thank you, Robert. It's the ninth judgment. The only one that's going to be greater and get Pharaoh to finally say go is the death of the firstborn. But notice in 1021, the Lord said to Moshe, stretch up your hand toward heaven that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. That's more than just the sun didn't shine. That's more than just a gloomy day which depresses the spirit. This was a darkness that they felt. I think it's equal to the wanting to gnaw their tongues or close to it in Revelation. Maybe not quite because that description isn't given there, but they had a good person. They had a good taste of it. So even from just these few, we see darkness being judgment. We see God who is light. In his light is, if, when we're in his presence, we're in his light. Amen. Once again, we have the darkness over the face of the earth. I have to see that as a judgment. I cannot see that as that's how God created. I don't see God do stages of creation like the evolutionary process would tell you. I see God create and create perfectly. I think he created a perfect environment for an angelic family. But Satan over here, and uh, over, over it, with other angels under him, he gave him a kingdom. He gave him rule. He gave him an anointed position. He made him beautiful. He did a lot for Satan. He had it great. He was lacking nothing. But unrighteousness was found in his heart. Sin was found in him. He raised himself up to be equal with God, to even dethrone God, and God had to judge him for it. That judgment ultimately will be in, cast into hell forever. But we know even now he is free, running rampant on the face of this earth. Peter even describes him as the lion seeking whom he may devour. Not as the lion of the tribe of Judah. But we know he is. He's got power. And look at what he's doing. It's horrible. But how did he get that back in? If his, if his kingdom was judged and he was judged, how did he get back in? Through man after man because he wanted to usurp it and bring it back. He did cause man to fall, but God said, I will redeem him. And God put his plan in for redemption. We will see it in the millennial kingdom where the rule of God is the same in heaven and on earth, but after that millennial kingdom, we see Satan loosed out of the pit where he'd been held so that he could not create problems during the millennium. During the millennium, the people living then will not be taunted by Satan. Every one of us who is a believer knows what I mean about being taunted by Satan. Mm -hmm. It's constant in our lives. But it's what grows us spiritually, too. So God even uses what's meant for evil in terms of for good in your life. Because if you didn't have that antagonist, 
You wouldn't grow your roots down in the Lord. You wouldn't know his grace. You wouldn't know his love. And you wouldn't know his mercy. But there's a time coming when God says enough is enough. Satan again does the same thing at the end of the millennium. Before we go into eternity future, he says, I'm going to come up against the, the, the Most High God. I'm going to get my whole army with me, and we're going to go up, and we are going to dethrone God. We're going to dethrone the Lamb, and I'm going to be God. And he goes through the face of the earth, gaining a multitude of people from the millennium who only feigned in their hearts that they were one with God. And when they were given a chance to show what was in their hearts, it was as evil as what was in Satan's heart. They want Satan for their God. They're going to line up behind them. Remember the third of the angels that, that in that first when he was cast out of heaven, now we've got mankind, it says so many that are the sands of the sea that follow him. I, I'm amazed at that after they lived in a perfect environment in the presence of our holy God, excuse me, I cannot imagine that that many, that that pride is so strong and I think the sin God hates the most because it, it, it takes those he loves from him and they come up they come up to dethrone the Lord, to, to take out God off of his throne, and that's when the judgment comes down. And Satan is cast into the lake of fire forever. It's where we, he sees the beast and the false prophet are. That's why we know it's after. We know we fall our time, but if we follow God, that they never come never to be repeated. Never will a sin come into the new heavens and the new earth Amen. that are created. And oh, by the way, that creation is also a fresh new creation. That one's not a refurbishing or a bringing about again. That's a fresh new one. And that one will never have the state of sin. And God couldn't look at Jesus on the cross because he took on sin. And Satan is pure evil. How can how can Satan go to heaven? He does not go and dwell in heaven because we know sin doesn't enter into heaven. But he comes into the presence of God in some way that we cannot fully comprehend or understand. With the intent of coming against, you know, coming and saying, you know, this one's evil, this one's bad, you know. Um, calling us out, so to speak, well, trying he, to say to God, he's the accuser. He's the accuser. So he's so he, he constantly. Yes, but he, he, he. I don't know how. Maybe God doesn't even look at him. But the conversation is there. I don't know how to explain it. I just know he is, for a time, allowed to be the accuser of the brethren, as Scripture puts it. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. For him. Um, Yes, yes. Remember in Job, when Job is very much in the beginning. Job is not halfway through your, what you call Old Testament chronologically. Job's back with the patriarchs. He's back probably before Abraham's day. And Satan goes to, to him, goes to the Father. So in some way they are able to talk. Who's the Holy and Spirit in the communication? Through the Holy Spirit? I mean, is he here? Well, is a God what I'm saying is, Satan isn't like us. He doesn't have skin on. He no, no, I mean, not, yeah, he's, an, he's an angel that has corrupted himself. So I don't know how he's speaking with God, but he is he is allowed to come to God and say, look at Job. Look at Job. He's only trusting you because you're spoiling him wrong. You know, and they go through that. Yes. He, he is a spirit. And I, I don't know how to explain it, but it's... Um, and remember, it's the way the Lord felt in his humanity. You know, we know God doesn't look on sin and accept sin. I don't know how to explain it fully. I have a question. Okay, that. before your question, are yeah. you going to help us answer? Has to do with yeah, it. then let me get Eric's comment, and then I'll get your question. That's, well, that's what I, I, I was saying about oh. Satan. Okay. Yes. If he was, you, we read that he was beautiful, mm -hmm. and then you're describing him as, um, uh, the, the, oh dear, the, no, 
Corrupted. Yes, but then there's another word. Uh, the the oh the animal. What do you call it? It's the 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 no, no. The 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 in, in Revelation, the dragon. The dragon. The dragon. Okay. <laughs> it, is that just um, it, in, in other words to describe him? But but he's beautiful also. So he's a he deceiver. was created beautiful. Right. Yeah. I don't believe. I believe that his image was warped by his fall. Okay. And the dragon. The connotation is, you know, uh, is not the dragon is beautiful. The dragon is beast. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. 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 I, I get them saying questions from my kids and all that. And I, I read the Bible a lot. And the Lord has told me to tell my children, look, there's a lot of questions there that we're not going to know. Right, right. We're not so, going to fully understand. So, save them for the end. And by the time we get there to ask them, we ain't going to care about it anyway. <laughs> and remember, we're going to see him as bad is what troubled us. Yeah. We're going to see him, minute, we're going to see him as a wimpy little thing. We're not going to see him. Powerful. We're not going to see him beautiful. We're not going to see him as a great dragon. We're going to see him as something. Well, just, just right. This is just what I'm doing. Exactly. That's what I'm referring to. Yeah. This is the one. Yeah. 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 So, how do I explain that he, being evil, is allowed into the presence of God, yet he does not contaminate heaven because heaven cannot be contaminated? So, I, don't, I cannot explain how. And I cannot, maybe it happens. In the in the universe of God's heaven, where the voices are heard, where Satan says, and God says, Satan says, and God says, I don't know. It's we like Eric said, we're not going to understand how it gets This is how it was done. Yeah. Naomi? And no, it's just something that one day, angels, plural, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them, which would imply that. There was a reporting in time. Right. Oh, yeah. right. Right. Yeah. right. Right. Yeah, because I'm sure the brothers out with other assignments and other kingdoms and other, you know, um, the same way that we come up with the beautiful, oh my goodness, Aubrey, the beautiful theory, hear me, theory, and Kathy, I'll get you right after me. The, the, when I say theory, is something I cannot give you scripture and verse and say this is it, okay? But I think it's a great idea. When we go into eternity future, we have the people who lived through the millennium who did not follow Satan in the end, who were not of his kingdom, who were true worshipers of the Lord. We don't read of them being given a new body. We read about them continuing on. The same way Adam and Eve would have continued on had they never sinned, they'd be alive today. Death doesn't enter in. They're going to go on. Remember Adam and Eve were to fill the face of the earth. They were to, to have children. These people who live through the millennium are going to be having children. Well, eventually, this planet's going to fill up. You know, you can only put so many people on the face of the planet. If nobody's dying off, you're going to get sardine in time. <laughs> the idea, the thought is, perhaps God will take a people... He will put them on another planet, make that planet inhabitable. They will continue living on. And what are they doing on that planet? The same thing that the people down here on earth are doing, praising God, worshiping God. So when you start going through the eternity of time, and don't ask me how long that is, because none of us know that we know there is no time, but we know it goes on forever. Remember all those galaxies I was telling you about? Remember all those planets? Remember how we don't even know what goes beyond? But what if just in the amount that we know, we can see all of those planets with people worshiping and praising the master creator. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that exciting? Wouldn't you love to see all of the heavens, which now through the stars are declaring the gospel, in a sin-soaked atmosphere, in a world that's, that's not up to par? What about when it is up to par? What's it going to be like? But if the whole universe, the whole galaxy, all of creation is worshiping their God, bowing down to their God, singing praises to their God. <coughs> Remember, come was variety. You think they're all going to look and sound like us? The gods up there is dancing out. I think, whew. 
just like what we see. Look at the Hubble. Oh my word, the colors, the designs. That's just in what we're seeing. What's beyond? What's God going to do with all of that? All that brings glory to it, but now put peoples there to sing its praises, to speak it forth. Oh, we, I can get excited. <laughs> I can't wait to see it. Kathy, before I forget you. Uh oh. She I don't know, I have to ask it now, but. Oh. Doesn't it say that he approaches the throne of God and accuses? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. We look at it like a, a trial going on. God's yep. sitting there as a judge. And I love, it's one of the Calvary Chapel pastors, so I love the way they do the commercial thing. And Satan's come up, and he's, and I'm going to use me. I'm not going to use any of you. But he's come to the the judgment, um, the bench, you know, and he's accused Rochelle. You know, she has done this dastardly deed, you know. She's just not who you're saying she is. And uh, the, um, the defense attorney, you know, comes up. And um, sidebar, you honor. There you go. Sure. So this one comes up and talks to the judge. Um, hey, Dad. <laughs> this one's mine. Case dismissed. <laughs> not original, but I like it. Yes. He accuses that the Lord is our advocate. The Lord is standing in that gap for us. The Lord, is, is, his blood covers it all. Does that give me a right to go out and live my life as wickedly as I want, throw all care to the wind? Who cares? No. No. Paul said it should never be. It should make me want all the more to please my God, to live in accordance to his will and his way. And if you think you've got a long time to do what he's given you to do and by the way he gives everyone work to do just like a good parent gives yes. their children work to do don't count on tomorrow do you think Kobe Bryant do you think Jenna 13 years old thought when he woke up that morning this will be the last thing I do do you think the one who interviewed Kobe who said I never thought I'd never hear his voice again. Yes. Thought that in an instant it'd be gone. Do you think the 16 and 17 year old kids that were killed in that car over something so stupid yes. thought it, this is it? Do you think they thought for a moment I'm playing with my life? No, no. Any of us at a moment can be, the moment God ordained, it's over. If you've got something to do for the Lord, get off your. I know I'm speaking to the choir, but I fully believe whether it's because your day, your dash is going to end, and the dash is what counts between your two dates on your cruise phone, whether it's that or whether it's the Lord calling us home. I believe we're on the last moments. I'm not saying minutes, I'm saying moments. Moment. I agree. Go, get out, do, talk, tell, let's grab as many as we can, get their attention, and share lovingly, not forcefully. Lovingly, because it may be your last opportunity to say it. It may be their last opportunity to hear it. Because we don't know when life will be over. We are told it is a vapor. It is gone quickly. And even those who live into their 90s talk about the brevity of life. Mm -hmm. yeah. We've been given a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. We've been given knowledge. We have the Word of God. We've been Hold the truth. We, I believe all, and if you haven't, open up your heart right now and say, Lord, I want you. I want you for my salvation. I want you to save me. I want my sins forgiven. I want to know heaven is mine. And then with that, go out and go just on. just let his light so shine. The way that I've been told that uh, Rhonda's daughter is getting to shine before a Jewish family because of what happened in the news gave opportunity. For the name of Yeshua Jesus to come up. Oh, I can't do that. I'm shy. Oh, I can't do that. I don't know enough scripture. 
Is the Holy Spirit in you? Is he shine? Does he know the word of God? Got any more excuses? Right. I will put the words in you. Yeah. Yeah. You will know what to say. Yes. 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 And the only thing I'll say, couch it in love. Love is what wins. No one wants anything forced down their throat. No one's brought to the Lord by someone forcing something down their throat. On the contrary, we know what the damage that does. But love. Is anyone in here not capable of showing love? Because we've all been loved, so we can show that love. So, gotta close, gotta get off. Yes, it don't give up. It took me 20 years to, for my uh, uh, sister in law. Yeah, don't give up. Don't give up. Where there is life, there is hope. If they're on their deathbed and they're in a coma, we're told hearing goes last, get in their ear and share the love of their Savior. And no worries if you let down, they don't go to hell because you didn't do it. You just miss the blessing that God will send someone else or an angel. He's not going to let any perish. Okay, before there's any more comments, let, us, let me close the first so we can... Oh, Tony, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, one way to be able to take the conversation with anybody, they talk about Kobe Bryant, right? Everywhere. So you can ask them, where is Kobe Bryant now? Where is Kobe Bryant now? What do you think they'll say? They don't know. Well, maybe, maybe they say, oh, well, yeah, yeah. Some, some people that we think that we can give, give, give each no, it's an opportunity for you. heaven or hell. We have no authority. No, no, it's no. an opportunity no. for you to But, but, but he's yeah. using yeah. such yeah. 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 How do you know he's yeah. bad? Yeah. How do you know he's bad? Yeah. 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 On what basis? Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, do you know they say that him, he, and his uh, daughter went to, to church? Yes. 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 But what does that does mean? That, yeah. Does what that, does that save mean? them? No, it says that they have religion. It does not tell us whether they have relationship. And that's why we don't take anything for granted. You're not a Christian because you're born in America. You're not a Christian because you go to a certain church. It's what you've done in your heart. And that's all that it is. God judges the heart. He looks at the heart. And that's why we hope that they had more than religion. We hope they had relationship. But we don't know. And Tony's point isn't to judge them. You can flip it on themselves. If you were to die, do you know where you go? On what basis? Because if they say, oh, I'm a good person, I'll go to heaven. Well, show me where God says what good is good enough. Because maybe my definition of good isn't your definition of good. And who gets to go by whose definition? There's got to be a standard. There's got to be something that's set. And we know it's set by the word. Yes. So, and uh, remember, it's the Ruch Kodesh, the Holy Spirit, who is going to be quickening the word that you are giving as he directs your words to their hearts, because he's the one who tugs at them to bring them into that state of knowledge. No one comes to God but when the Holy Spirit reveals God to them. Not us, not anyone else. All we are is just the conduit. That's it. Yeah. So, don't worry about your... your insecurities, your abnormalities. Don't worry if you're all warts and you can't say anything good. God can. <laughs> and he does. Well, and, 10, 9, and 10. I'm sorry? Well, that's 10, 9, and 10. Which is? Confess your mouth. Believe in your heart that, Christ, that God has raised Jesus from the dead. Well, Lord, you speak it. it. You shall be saved. Yes. You yes. shall be. It's not to be made. No. Now, God doesn't make it if he, he lets you know. He lets you know. So I was going to share with you, she was saying about college back then, I went when I was 12. You could not see the person on your side. No. You could not no. see your face. No. No. I, mean, it I couldn't see my daddy's arms scary. holding me. Yes. <coughs> yes. Yes. And so that's, we were that's there. darkness. Yes. My dad took me down there. It took all oh, so bad. <laughs> so, now that you were three witnesses. It's scary. For a moment. What did you say?
It's in New Mexico. They're in New Mexico. Oh, she's in the edge of New Mexico in Texas. Yeah. Yeah. We were on a trip like back east and we stopped in major places along the way. Okay, it's wrapped up. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, they are. They like to talk to the other ones. See you later. The catacombs are very Yes. You want to pray? Yes. Pray. Yes. <laughs> Our awesome and admirable God of creation, we thank you that you are also the author of our salvation. We thank you that you are the light of this world. We thank you that you love man enough so much to leave Adam, to come to earth, to, to grow up to die for us. But Lord God, thank you the story doesn't end there. You rose from the dead. You are not on the cross today. You are alive. You are rose. You are at the right hand of the Father, sitting on the throne in control and giving to us abundant life. Yes. Oh God, how we thank you. How we praise you. If that was all you ever did, that was dying. It was enough. But we thank you that you do even more. You use us. Oh Lord, use us to your glory. Shine your light through us that men will see our Father in heaven and glorify you. Send us out this week to be your emissaries. Give us the joy of sharing you with others. And Lord God, let those hearts turn to you that more and more can be a part of our special family and go home soon and very soon. We are going to see our King. Hallelujah. Praise you. Thank you. We love you. And your precious you know, it's like we need we need room for like two more seats. Anybody see the pages? Look at your, look at your cross.